Good evening. Hello and good evening. The um, I find myself on the couch this evening, uh, recording this lecture with a slightly unsteady camera. Sorry about that. Particularly if you're uh, just had a meal. Uh, the um, the two modules I've got for you tonight, um, I'm going to do consecutively. Um, so the first one we'll do, and you can either have a read of the review of the uh, the reading that I've posted online before or after. Uh, I'd probably recommend uh, reading it after a watch of this and then have a read of it. I'm not going to read through the thing verbatim. I'm just going to go and have a bit of an overview of what the um, paper talks about. Um, but the reading I've given you is an excerpt of a larger document which covers um, the workers' compensation history in, uh, in pretty good detail. Uh, not so much detail that you become a history professor, uh, but then that's not what's required of you. Um, the emphasis of it is, uh, is for you to start to have a think about uh, where the scheme came from, what were the major triggers for it changing, uh, and um, what's behind the, um, uh, the evolution of workers' comp uh, to where it is today. Uh, in the next part of this module, uh, the 2.2, which is up there, there's a reading there which talks about what an ideal scheme could look like, what would be the characteristics of an ideal scheme. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the tutorial that I'll give there is just a bit of a discussion around elements of what that might look like. Uh, it's a paper based on a paper that was written uh, by a consultancy uh, to try and put across what might be the elements of an ideal scheme. Uh, it's not about trying to suggest that all that they say is correct, but what it does have in it is some good prompts, uh, I guess. Uh, and when you've reflect on the history and you look at the prompts uh, it'll make some sense around you know why the screen why the scheme why the schemes change uh, and what they're changing toward and because of cryptic enough uh, let me flick over now to the slides here we go all right we'll jump into that again uh, okay blah 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 um, all right workers compensation history of workers compensation in Australia as I say, this is not going to be a um, war and peace on uh, the history of workers' compensation around the world. Uh, it, but what it is meant to be is takeaway messages for you so that you understand that this whole scheme has come from somewhere uh, and it's ended up where it is today through a whole variety of happenstance. Uh, in some very early things I mentioned in this, uh, this program, uh, I talked about... Uh, the conversation that Michael had been having around who the client is and I suggested that possibly uh, economics might be the client in, in some of this. Uh, I think when you look at the history you'll see that economics plays a pretty significant role. Um, uh, but later I'll hopefully when we talk about the, uh, the best practice scheme uh, what uh, the takeaway message will be around how we manage the economics and the role of how we manage people uh, plays a very significant part in how those economics uh, occur. All right, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, I'm sure people have heard about it. It's the, the, the mechanisation of, of production uh, in, um, uh, around the world, uh, the latter half of the 18th century. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, uh, there's absolutely no question there were injuries at work before the Industrial Revolution, uh, but I'm sure people can picture just what the Industrial Revolution did for uh, the, uh, the, work, the, the occurrence of workplace injury. Um, there was machinery where there'd never been machinery before, uh, and there were people using it for the first time. Uh, there were very, very young people using it, uh, and uh, there were not the incentives on employers uh, and it wasn't the focus of the economy at the time either. The focus of the economy was on uh, getting more out of less, more, more produce out of less resource uh, at a lower cost for production. Uh, that's what the Industrial Revolution was about. One of the uh, very you know, sad outcomes of it was the level of injury uh, that occurred. Um, the courts obviously are always intended to be independent, but they, they reflect the time, I guess. Uh, and... Uh, the, the only way that people could get any kind of um, any kind of um, oh, compensation, I guess, for, uh, for any injury that occurred at work was to go through the courts uh, and to um, apply the common law. Uh, now, I'm just going to keep on using the term common law. I'm not going to attempt to try and define it for you. Um, uh, 
I think that's uh, something that um, students at your level are able to do independently. Um, but uh, if, if you're not 100% familiar with common law, then go away and have a quick look um, and, and get yourself a good sense of it. Obviously not the detail of it, uh, but enough to understand that, uh, you know, the courts, the common law is uh, uh, the obligation on people not to harm others in very, very lay terms. Uh, and uh, so... What, when the courts were determining a case that came before them in terms of an injury that occurred at work, uh, at the time, the courts in England, which is obviously where our legal um, legal system derives from, um, they weren't particularly inclined to compensate individuals. So the levels of compensation, if they were awarded at all, were pretty low. Um, there really wasn't much of an incentive for people to go through the court system uh, because it was so expensive. So for an injured worker to contemplate the cost of a case that would likely not give them any compensation or at least very little uh, wasn't a very uh, tempting uh, activity. Uh, a lot of workers were just ignorant about the whole process and weren't aware what they might be entitled to. Um, this is not the internet generation <laughs> in the late 18th century. Um, a lot of people just didn't know a lot. Uh, and... Um, Obviously, it was a you know a, a class system where there was a real clear us and them. Uh, the courts um, require evidence, uh, and oftentimes co-workers weren't inclined to want to be an ev uh, provide evidence against an employer. Um, employees at the time were uh, you know very worried about losing their jobs. There's a machine now, there's a machinery now that's replacing people, uh, and so the jobs are harder to come by, uh, and uh, require a little bit more skill, um, so harder to get. Uh, so, you know, the injured, injured parties or people who may have some evidence against the employer, they're not inclined to want to get into a fight with the employer and potentially lose um, their, their only means of, uh, of, um, of income. Uh, as a general rule, um, the courts held that the duty of care, which is the basis of common law, the duty of care owed by an employer to their employees um, was very low. There wasn't a high expectation uh, in the minds of the court that employers really had to look after their employees. Uh, so yeah, so workers, workers accepted that they worked in risky jobs uh, and the potentially a greater risk than being in a, a, a job that could potentially harm you was uh, being unemployed. And that's how they tended to approach their relationship with their employers. So the courts weren't highly so weren't used rather weren't used to try and resolve these uh, work type in, work injury issues. Um, it was around the end of the nineteenth century that workers' compensation schemes came into place. Um, it was fairly well accepted that common law had had failed to protect workers and to provide adequate compensation to injured workers, uh, and it was accepted that the legislation was going to be the only thing that was going to resolve the issue for uh, for society and for injured workers. So where did it first start? Um, Germany. Uh, and uh, Otto von Bismarck, uh, not necessarily known as a, uh, a large advocate for socialism. Um, in fact, he, he, the literature will tell you that uh, his view was that uh, if that if he felt that if uh, he did take steps to try and provide assistance to people with work injuries, uh, that then he may uh, prevent uh, the people screaming for socialism uh, because they could see that um, uh, that there were steps being taken to protect people. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so perhaps if they were getting what they wanted, uh, Bismarck thought that uh, that might prevent them wanting to take more radical steps like uh, removing him and installing a socialist government. Uh, the first act around workers' compensation was uh, the Accident Assurance Act of 1887. Uh, so it was one of the first acts to to have as part of its philosophy was this no fault principle. Uh, so uh, when you've gone to that way and done your reading about common law, one of the things that common law requires if you're going to try and recover for damages or loss of income uh, under common law is that you have to actually find somebody at fault. So somebody has to be the cause of it and you have to be able to um, provide evidence that demonstrates they're at, they're at fault. Uh, the Accident Insurance Act didn't require fault. Uh, essentially, it says then what it says now, which is um, that um, something's happened at work, we're not going to need to find fault to say that this individual should be provided with some compensation. Uh, and the compensation was outlined in the Act. 
Uh, so uh, 1897 was the next piece of uh, legislation around workers' compensation, and that came into place in England, and I've misspelled act there, which is remarkable given it's only a three-letter word. Um, but English Workers' Compensation Act, which um, was based on the German model. Um, the German model was the, the beginnings of these types of legislation. Uh, so Australia, so yeah, so 1897, um, by, the three, by 1900, South Australia uh, put an act in place. Uh, and then all the act, all the states, um, obviously in Federation 1901, um, all the states then uh, uh, worked towards putting in place their own scheme. Uh, and that occurred between that period of 1900 to 1926. Um, the very large last territory in Australia to have a Workers' Compensation Act was um, uh, the, uh, the uh, ACT, um, which was in about the 1950s. Um, and I haven't included all the dates there because you don't need to remember that. But uh, what's interesting is the states didn't all come at it at once. They came gradually over time, uh, and each state um, obviously used the template of previous states and their experiences to try and determine what they do. Um, but yeah, by by 1926, pretty much all the states had all the states had their legislation. Uh, by 1950 odd, uh, all the territories also had them in place. Uh, and uh, over the years, coverage broadened, so more people were included under the definitions, uh, and benefits were increased. Um, and um, uh, more injuries and diseases were defined as being acceptable uh, for compensation or being included for compensation under their acts. Um, and uh, a key bit of change in wording, um, sorry the dot points are a little bit out of alignment there, um, but uh, coverage under these acts was broadened from being an injury arising out of and in the course of employment to arising out of or in the course of employment. Um, so obviously the key is different. The first um, statement there uh, requires both those elements be met. It's arising out of and it's in the course of employment. Um, and the change was arising out of or in the course of employment. So it could be either, either or. Uh, so uh, this was in the reading and I thought it was very interesting. Um, uh, a lot of the resources that I'll use on a day-to-day -day basis come out of... Um, uh, the Accident Compensation Corporation, which is uh, New Zealand's um, solution to um, workers' compensation, uh, it's a you know very interesting scheme. Uh, offers often heralded as being a, a, a template for good practice. Um, it has a scheme that compensates everybody, regardless of how they're injured. So whether you're injured at work or walking along the footpath or uh, injured in a car accident, um, you'd be supported by the Accident Compensation Corporation uh, and the legislation and all the benefits that that uh, entails. Um, and uh, th that scheme came into place after the uh, um, uh, um, publication of a report in 1967. Um, the same author uh, of that report uh, did a report for uh, in Australia, uh, which was uh, completed in 1974. Um, at the time, the government in 1974 was the Labor government. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, the following year, obviously, we uh, experienced uh, something uh, very unusual in a, in a parliamentary democracy, which was the, the sacking by a foreign government of our prime minister uh, and his government. Um, so, uh, you know, had it not been for that event, uh, quite possibly we would have a scheme very similar to uh, what they have in New Zealand. Um, what, what would that look like? Uh, it wouldn't be state-based. It would be all the states combined. Uh, it would uh, it wouldn't it would be compensation regardless of how you sustained uh, the injury or, or illness. Um, and I often often think about that because I regularly think about that that reading. It, it it's often in my mind the reading that uh, that's been provided to you previously, and I've mentioned a couple of times, which is um, that uh, outcomes for rehabilitation uh, for for injuries are different depending on what scheme you're being supported by. So if you break your leg and you're being covered by workers' compensation, compared to break your leg and you're being covered by compulsory third-party insurance from a motor vehicle accident, um, the evidence shows that uh, under the workers' compensation scheme, and when compared to all other schemes, uh, you will have a, a slower recovery and a greater level of disability at the conclusion. Um, so it wouldn't it be interesting to look at a scheme where it didn't matter how you were injured uh, and uh, you were treated the same regardless of how that occurred. I um, wonder what that would do for the rates of recovery for work-related injury. Interesting.
Um, some other key point and po times in, uh, points in time, um, 1970s through the 1980s, um, there was the big push for the deregulation. So, you know, Hawke was the federal um, prime minister. Um, we were looking to deregulate, uh, which is which is to say to not provide such strict rules around how various things happen in the economy. And workers' comp was the same. Uh, the, sorry, workers' compensation was different in that uh, where, where in all other places the governments were looking to deregulate, uh, workers' compensation were subjected to uh, greater regulation. Um, I popped in there just, uh, which are the dates are a little bit out of order, but I popped in there the date of 1916. Um, lo whilst lots of states have had reviews and reports done and changes made to the legislation as they go along, Queensland's been fairly um, consistent. Um, and uh, a part of that is identified as being related to the fact that um, it's been the one with the longest period of uh, government um, underwriting. So that, so, that, so basically it's, it's a government monopoly. The government owns workers' compensation. Uh, in, a, in New South Wales there were periods of um, uh, underwritten insurance where private companies took the risk for insurance uh, and there were periods when the government, as it is now, uh, underwrite all the risks. So the people who are the insurance companies, the, the, um, uh, the agents, that uh, you deal with and we call them insurance companies uh, they're actually claims agents it's not their money at risk um, the uh, all the money at risk is the state government money uh, that's um, you know relatively new as in like 30 plus years or so in new south wales but in queensland that had, that had been the case for a longer period of time and that's and queensland is viewed as being the scheme that's uh, had the you know, greatest stability uh, and uh, been most likely identified as being most financially viable in terms of uh, the premiums it collects from from uh, workers, uh, from employers, uh, and those premiums' ability to cover the costs related to the claims that get incurred. Um, so it was during that time there was a greater focus on the need to link uh, occupational health and safety with workers' comp, uh, and also the need to reduce the levels of legal conflict uh, in the system. So one of the um, big drivers in of costs in the scheme uh, relate to um, or have historically related to uh, legal involvement. Um, so the fees that solicitors charge uh, incur massive costs. The biggest cost by far is in, in the cost of workers' compensation is, is always the lost wages paid to employees who aren't at work. Uh, and as I'll touch on in the next 2.2 uh, module, um, uh, there's a relationship between the levels of conflict that occur in the system and the amount of time that people lose from work. So essentially, if you're in a, in a legal conflict, uh, your emphasis, your, what you're trying to emphasise is how disabled you are, and uh, you do that obviously by being uh, undertaking lots of medical treatment and being absent from work uh, and being unemployable. Um, so, um, so yeah, so the, so the scheme started to recognise there was a need, and so recent activity, particularly in New South Wales, has been to limit uh, the uh, levels of conflict that can occur. So uh, things will occur in the system now that don't require there to be a, a, a solicitor involved and for them to make a legal application on your part uh, if you're an injured worker. They've also regulated the fees for solicitors, reduced them, uh, and uh, and the, the fees are now related to carrying out certain activities, so they're not related to uh, the value of the compensation awarded, they're related to the, value, the, the, uh, the amount of time that generally is required to complete a certain task. Um, so as a result, there's uh, lots of legal firms around uh, New South Wales uh, who have gotten out of workers' compensation because uh, the, the money just isn't there for them. Uh, and um, uh, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, these solicitors aren't hanging around um, because of their desire to achieve social justice uh, and, uh, and legal justice for their clients. They're here to make as much money as they can. Uh, so they've scattered elsewhere, uh, and uh, a lot of them, most of them, have scattered too. And you probably notice if you watch TV at all, uh, the ads for uh, under your superannuation or your life insurance scheme, you may be entitled to lump sum compensation. Um, so the new thing for insurance for solicitors is to chase the money uh, that uh, might be available to injured people under uh, their life insurance policy or their superannuation policy. Um, when I say or, uh, these days New South Wales, uh, sorry in Australia. Superannuation is compulsory, uh, and uh, when you take out a superannuation policy, you receive a without asking for it a default level of um, income protection, life insurance, uh, and uh, oftentimes something called uh, total and permanent disability (TPD). 
so um, friends of mine tell me that um, these days if you go and see a solicitor because you've got a workers' compensation claim, uh, I'm sure they'll make sure that you lodge your claim and everything proceeds happily. Um, and then they'll ask you to t talk to me about your superannuation scheme. Uh, but basically what they're saying is that yes they can help you with your workers compensation but they're not going to make any money out of it these days uh, but if they can chase some money for you under your life insurance policy such as your total and permanent disability um, then there's money in that for them and that's where they will shift their interest okay so the changes that were coming around were around looking for cost control uh, uh, that's what's sort of happening through the 90s. Um, as I said before, it's lost wages that are a massive cost in the system. Um, so legislation and the, and the, um, the regulations uh, started to change where there was a push towards um, a return to work focus. Um, now, you know, we understand as, uh, as rehab counsellors that um, returning to work is important. I mean, it's implicit in the term rehabilitation, which means, you know, back to where you came from. Uh, the, the idea is that uh, the more the better your rehabilitation, the closer you are to where you were at the point in time that you uh, were injured or ill, became ill, um, the better that is for you. And, and the, legislate, uh, the, the science is clear on that. Obviously, it's better for people to be at work. It's better for people to be independent at work. It's better for people not to be affected by illness and injury. Um, uh, fortunately, I guess, um, that coincides with um, a way to save money in the scheme. Uh, in workers' compensation schemes. So that, start, that, that return to work focus started to be Im Im embedded into the legislation and the regulations. Um, people may be familiar more recently uh, with um, 2012, the changes that occurred. Um, probably the thing that people remember is there, was a, there were going to be some big changes in how much benefits were worth and the length of time you could access them if you're injured in workers' comp in New South Wales. Uh, the biggest thing I think that made the media uh, there was um, that uh, people objected to the police and the fire brigades and those people being uh, affected in that way, uh, and uh, their you know very powerful unions uh, lobbied the government and managed to have them uh, separated from those changes in legislation. Uh, but for everybody else, um, they um, those changes did come into effect. Uh, now, the reason for those changes weren't because anyone thought that people were more likely to go back to work if they had shorter benefits, a fewer benefits, and for a lesser period of time. Um, uh, it wasn't to do that with all. It was, it, what it was to do with was um, the New South Wales scheme owed more money than it was collecting in premiums. It, it had what they call unfunded liabilities, uh, and uh, employers felt the premiums were becoming too expensive. Um, the New South Wales governments want businesses to do well, make more money, pay tax. Uh, which all goes into the government coffers. Uh, so because the, we have a Liberal government uh, in New South Wales and because the business uh, lobbyists were successful, um, they managed to lobby for those changes in legislation. So those changes arguably don't do anything to benefit injured workers. Um, they certainly are viewed as being a benefit to uh, the economy um, and uh, large private employers uh, who, who um, make up the economy. Um, so yeah, so there's the history. Uh, some has related to the economics of the time, some has related to, um, I guess, aspects of social, social justice. Um, always interesting and funny to think that um, possibly the first workers' compensation legislation, which had a, a socialist bent to it, uh, was intended to try and prevent the socialists rather than to try, to try and uh, bring around huge social change. But we have the scheme we have now. It didn't, didn't happen... Uh, by accident, it happened over a long period of time. Uh, its historic roots are way back in Germany, back in the 1890s, uh, 1880s, uh, and uh, and changes. and And you can track those changes looking at which governments are in power, uh, Liberal and Labor governments. Um, I think interestingly, over time, some of the bigger changes in workers' compensation legislation uh, and industrial legislation in general have occurred under Labor governments, um, uh, possibly. Um, and this is a very um, basic theory, but possibly because uh, Labor governments are in very large way um, uh, reflective and supported by uh, union movements, and uh, the union movements are, are going to have to convince a lot of people to accept certain changes for them to be successful and for those governments to be re-elected, so you know, possibly that's why those sort of changes occur. Um, but I think the big take-home from this is these things don't happen in a void. Uh, they are heavily cost-driven. Um, I think over time, as the triangle narrows to a point um, the ex if we accept that it's about trying to control costs there's a greater acceptance uh, 
that uh, what's good for people is good for the economy in the sense that uh, if people get back to work and uh, become independent back at work, uh, then uh, that will save money, which benefits us all. Very simplistic. <laughs> But I think when you're reading the legislation and you're thinking about what's in the regulations and how those uh, roll out into policy, um, you need to be thinking about what's happening at the time in the economy, who's, who's, which government's in power, uh, where, where's it's all taking us. All right, I'll end 2.1 there. Um, there'll be some questions for you up just to check your um, check your learning. Uh, and uh, there's uh, if you then flick down to uh, section module 2.2, um, there's another uh, uh, recording there for you, uh, another reading. Um, I'd suggest for that one to uh, read first, uh, and uh, and then I'll talk about aspects of that. Uh, but again, I'm not going to talk about the document. I'm not going to read it or lecture to it. I'm going to talk about some of the ideas in it. All right.